Well, good morning. Here I am, I'm rugged up with my winter coat because we live in Melbourne. And um, Friday, I think, we went to about 34 degrees. And today, I don't think it's reached 18 yet. Anyway, this is a different kind of Sunday. We have with us our grandson Jacob and Ken Margo, whom most of you in Blackburn Prezi know, because we are trying to adjust the system, the royal we, um, in the hope that in a few weeks the government will reduce the the four square, square metre rule, which is what stopped us opening today, um, and we'll be able to meet again. So I'm just going to hand over to Graham now and um, sit back and listen and leave others to take all the responsibility. Thank you, Christine. And a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church, as Christine has said. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, really good to have you with us this morning. We've been streaming church since the 22nd of March, so quite a long time now. Today is the first Sunday in Advent, and we're looking forward to Christmas. Uh, I think everybody's looking forward to Christmas. In Victoria, we've uh, just qualified for four weeks of no new infections and no COVID deaths. And uh, this is a remarkable milestone uh, for us and uh, people are starting to feel grateful and uh, a new sense of freedom, but aware that the old, uh, the old uh, re uh, cautions need also apply. So we're trying to be cautious and wise as we step out day by day. We're going to begin our service by praying together. and We invite you to join us in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our one triune and holy God, draw near to us now with your presence, we pray. We want to give thanks for the good news of Christmas that you have drawn near to us and we pray that in it all, we might ourselves draw near to you and discover your presence, the wonder of your presence, day by day with us in our lives. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we've got Amanda with us. Uh, she sent in a clip uh, of Bach's uh, piece of Bach music entitled My Faithful Heart Rejoice and I'm delighted that we can bring this to you this morning uh, in this clip.
Well, good morning again. Um, and I just need to check. I'm looking at the phone, aren't I? Um, well, the title of Young at Heart today is School in Kabul. Sorry, I don't know the exactly correct way to pronounce it. But um, that is the what I'm talking about, one school. In lockdown, with um, our grandson, actually, Jacob, who's here today, told us about a streaming service called Canopy, Canopy with a K. And this is free as long as you're a member of your local library and your local library has signed up. Last weekend, I watched a documentary called Learning to Skateboard in a War Zone. It, I think it's about 30 minutes, maybe a few minutes longer, and I really recommend it. Every, anyone can watch it, even primary school children. It's a very moving account of a school for girls in Kabul where the students are given a basic education, so basic literacy, and taught to skateboard as a way of helping them overcome their fears. At one point, the teacher asks the class, what is courage? One girl responds, courage is when someone goes to school. Courage is when someone goes to school. This is Afghanistan, where many people, especially the Taliban, believe that girls should not be educated. They should be illiterate and totally dependent on the men in their lives for everything that may have to be read. The commentary said, and I found this tragic, and as part of the Western world, I think, have we helped? Have we made it worse? Anyway, 17 years after what is called the fall of the Taliban, Afghanistan is still one of the worst places in the world to be a girl. And of course, as we know, the Taliban may have fallen in one sense, but they still can cause a lot of deaths, a lot of damage, a lot of destruction. The girls in this school are frisked on arrival as the Taliban now use children as suicide bombers. Explosions near schools and tertiary institutions are common. After seeing this documentary, I wanted to find out more about the organization running this school. It's called Skatistan. And for those of you who have watched Sammy G on ABC at 5 to 7 during lockdown, you know that he has called Melbourne Hookturnistan. Well, this is not Hookturnistan, this is Skatistan. And I quote from their website, it all started with one man and his three skateboards on the streets of Kabul in 2007. His idea grew into Skatistan, the first international initiative that we know of to combine skateboarding with educational outcomes. It now operates in South Africa and Cambodia as well as Afghanistan. Its mission to empower children and young people through skateboarding and education. They don't just educate girls, but in Afghanistan, they saw that this was where the greatest need was. What the teachers and parents at this school dread is the possibility that the peace talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban may lead to a return to power of the Taliban. That would spell, that would spell the end of all ep educational opportunities for girls and women. As many of you know, my parents were born into poor crofting families in Scotland and had to leave school at 14 so that they could contribute to the family income. They both 
believed strongly in the value of education and encouraged me and my sister to work very hard at school and go on to university and work hard there too. So my heart aches, even when in this country I hear of children who couldn't um, do online school in lockdown because they didn't have access to any internet. But my heart aches all the more when the very act of seeking an education can lead to the death of both students and teachers when you have to have courage to go to school. John Knox, the famous, well, famous for Scottish people and Presbyterians, the famous Scottish reformer, believed strongly in the value of education. In fact, the reformers in all countries believed that it was terribly important for individuals to be able to read so they could read the Bible and not depend on any priest, any denomination to tell them what God was telling them so they could read God's word themselves. One of the many things I enjoyed about teaching girls in I realized since I came to Australia, I have only taught in girls' schools. That was not my plan. That was the way it happened. But especially in my last 21 years at PLC, in religious education, we could look at the very significant role played by women in the spread of the gospel and the respect with which Jesus treated women. We also loved studying the book of Ruth in the Old Testament and the very important role of Ruth in the history of God's kingdom. But if you think back to the way Jesus not only healed Jairus' daughter, but the gentle way he spoke, the way he spoke to her, the way he um, addressed her when he had healed her. Also think of him sitting, talking to the woman at the well, with his disciples saying to one another, does he not know what kind of woman this is that he's sitting, talking to her publicly? And what did this woman then do? She ran and told her whole village about Jesus. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and he encouraged her to learn. Sometimes Paul is, I believe wrongly, portrayed as a misogynist. Read Romans 16. Many women feature there among the people to whom he sends greetings and of whom he says that they had been fellow workers, a great help, risked their lives for the sake of the gospel. So my heart sang as I watched the smiling faces of these young girls, learning to read, to write and to skateboard. At the same time, I prayed and will continue to pray that their world will not all come tumbling down as a result of the actions of evil men who make it their goal to confine women to illiteracy and to shatter all the dreams these girls and their parents have of a better life. May God save them from that. Good morning to you all. Uh, So good to be here. It's been a while and hope you're all well. Peace of Christ be be with you. Today's reading, if you have your Bibles with with you, we are looking at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, and we're reading from verses 18 to 25. Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Let's read. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her father, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, 
Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which, she, which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ken, and may God bless the reading of his word and to his name be the praise and the glory. This Advent, I want to see what each gospel has to say about Jesus coming into the world. Matthew opens with the human genealogy of Jesus just before the passage which Ken read to us. Jesus Matthew tells us, descends from a kingly line of David. It includes the mention of Ruth, whom Christine mentioned earlier. Jesus' DNA, as it were, reaching back to Abraham, the father of the Hebrews. Luke sets the stage with unexpected embryos and unusual women who carry them. Jesus begins life in Luke's gospel as a human baby. Mark's adult Jesus bursts on the scene with the wings of prophets and he's identified by a messenger crying in the wilderness. John is a philosopher, a seer and a mystic and he penetrates the earthly story of the human Jesus to give its profound implications. So as we look uh, one a week at these four Gospels, my hope and prayer is that uh, we will grow in faith as we look back on a year like no other, a year that's introduced us all to the word unprecedented. Today, then, we're beginning with Matthew. And I think the special emphasis on Matthew's gospel can be captured in one word, and that is the word Emmanuel. Eugene Peterson reminds us that we do not progress in the Christian life by becoming more competent, more knowledgeable, more virtuous, or more energetic. We do not advance in the Christian life by acquiring expertise. Each day and many times a day, we have to return to square one. God said, we adore and we listen. So with this in mind, I'd like to begin with square one, looking at the four Gospels and uh, Peterson's idea, taking us right back to what Matthew has to say. And Matthew uses the word Emmanuel. So here are the four words that, uh, that Peterson mentions. Uh, uh, stage, uh, square one, and then the four words that will make our headings today. First of all, we have a terrified king, Ahaz, and an unprecedented uh, experience. In his case, it was that he was in a war zone. Uh, Let me just remind you a little bit uh, from the beginning of uh, this gospel. I'll put the headings up a little bit out of sequence here myself. Uh, Stage uh, square one, and then uh, wait says uh, says Peterson, we have to come back to waiting, to adoring, and to listening. So these are our four headings today, and I want to take you to this very first one, uh, the, the idea of stage square one. Where does the word Emmanuel come from? Well, Matthew uh, tells us in the, in the reading we've had, as the prophet Isaiah said, it goes back to Isaiah chapter 7. Right there, we have a terrified king. His name is Ahaz, and he's out inspecting the water supply for the city. Why is he doing that? Well, 
Syria uh, further north and, uh, and Samaria to the immediate north. These two uh, kings are planning uh, to take Jerusalem. And so Ahaz is ex- expecting a siege. How long can the city hold out? Well, Isaiah the prophet comes to him and he knows that a much greater threat lies in Ahaz seeking the assistance of Assyria, the superpower in the story. So he urges the king to put his trust not in an Assyrian alliance, but in the promise of the Lord. And the prophet says to Ahaz, ask for a sign. And the king, with a kind of pious avoidance, says, I won't ask for a sign. I won't put the Lord to the test. And an exasperated Isaiah responds, Is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? All right then, if you won't ask, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And this is it. Look, a young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel. The word, the Hebrew word for young woman, Alma, uh, is used several times in the Old Testament, and it doesn't always mean virgin, but it's quite clear from the translation into Greek. Uh, the Greek uh, translation was made a couple of hundred years before the arrival of Jesus and several hundred years after Isaiah wrote it, and they used the Greek word parthenos, which does mean virgin. So there's a debate, a scholarly debate, I might say, about that word, But the word Emmanuel is actually a Hebrew sentence. Most names are Hebrew sentences, actually. And in fact, uh, when when Isaiah went to King Ahaz, he took his son with him. And the son had a name, Shia Jashu, which meant some will come back. It was meant to be an encouragement to the king, but he didn't uh, take it that way, obviously. So here's the name Emmanuel, the sign that God is going to give. God is with us. The amazing thing about the word Emmanuel is that God has not given up on us. We're guilty, and the Bible is very explicit about this, but it hasn't got, stopped God seeking us out and pursuing us to be his people. From the very beginning of the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, it's clear that the human family went astray. There are multiple words used to describe the wrong each slightly differently nuanced. We sin. That means we fall short of the target. We trespass, that is, we cross a boundary that we shouldn't have crossed. We've committed iniquity, that is, there's a crookedness within us where we should have been straight. All this is bad. The Bible gives a picture of damaged relationships at every imaginable level in the human family. God may seem withdrawn, people are at odds with each other, and even within themselves, people are not often comfortable, and the created environment suffers also. Our domestic grief and violence, something that we've been praying about particularly regularly in the, in the lockdown that we've experienced, uh, it easily escalates. We live in a world that has forgotten its maker in the pursuit of idols, yet the maker has not forgotten us. Matthew's gospel lets us know that God has come to be with us in a way that we never anticipated. Well, it wasn't quick. It's not a quick fix. Wait. The Lord will provide a sign, but wait. Matthew tells us of the royal line of David in chapter 1. And it culminates in Jesus. And he says that this person, this person is the ultimate application of the prophecy. Presumably there was a young woman at the time who gave birth to a child. And before that child was able to make decisions about right and wrong, the threat of Samaria and Syria had disappeared. But that wasn't where the prophecy ended. That was where it sort of began. It ended, says Matthew, here with Jesus, in the fullness of time, after a genealogy that's been carefully constructed to explain 14 generations, 14 generations, and then 14 generations to the Christ. 
the former Chief Rabbi of the United Kingdom and British Commonwealth, Lord Jonathan Sachs, who died early this month, traced his faith to Abraham. In that first book of the Bible, God came to Abraham and said, I will be your God and the God of your descendants. It was like, trust me and do what I say. And this amazing relationship at the beginning, the first book of our Bible, is what gave rise to the Bible. There would have been no Bible had that, uh, that verse not been penned. And the great characters of the Bible stand in that succession. Moses, Deborah, Joshua, Ruth, David, right the way down to Joseph and Mary, a royal line that Matthew gives us. Like us, they were flawed and sinful human beings. What happened to their culpability and their guilt? God wanted it removed. The plan was that it should be atoned for and erased. This was true at a personal level. See, for example, David's contrition in Psalm 51, created me a clean heart, O God. David yearning for that perfection that God offers. But it was also true at a corporate level with the institution of an atoning sacrifice, especially the annual Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. There were consequences uh, for denial of guilt, as the prophets made very clear. But repeatedly, the invitation is made to trust that God is with them and will make his home among them. Ezekiel picks up on this very idea with his image of the new temple from which rivers of life-giving water will flow. But there is a lot of waiting time, at least for us. The best-known Jewish prayer is called the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But is it really a prayer, asks uh, Rabbi Sachs. Indeed, maybe not, because it's really a, uh, it's an exhortation or a summons to wait on God and to be open to his voice. The Psalms mention many times the need to wait on God. The best known is perhaps Psalm 40. In the metrical version it reads, I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear. At length to me he did incline my voice and cry to hear. Or Psalm 130, more than the watchman watch for the morning, my soul waits for the Lord. And so the strands of prophecy in which these purposes of God are embedded uh, slowly and expressly come together. The fullness of time is represented by the genealogy, as I've mentioned in Matthew, the style of it and the symbolism. And then the anointed one comes, and he comes to atone for our sins. He explains that at the end of the gospel, before he leaves his disciples, Matthew 26 Verse 27, this covenant relationship which has shaped the whole of the Bible is what Jesus came to, to secure with his life's blood. So the consequence of this takes us to our next point, adore. The letter to the Hebrews tells us that all of these uh, saints of the past of Israel died in faith. The fulfillment was still future, and more awesome than they could have imagined. After all, God's plan from Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, had the entire world in view. How real was the expectation that God would do this? Well, it was very real, and they were looking for signs. As real as pregnancy and birth, I'm guessing. When the time had fully come, says Paul to the Galatians, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. And uh, the birth of a child is a time of strong feelings and deep emotions. And the first book of our New Testament tells us of the hostility of a Jewish king and the adoration of some wise men from far away coming to hear of Israel's God. And they worship the child, not as the person we expected, but gifts are given. Adoration is to drink in the baffling knowledge 
that we have been truly loved. Words can fail us. God is with us. God in God, there is life. God has given life to everything. In Jesus, we encounter the beauty, the goodness, and the truth of God. Moral values are established. Justice and injustice become clearer. A moral camp compass becomes open to us. And if you listen carefully with the birth of Emmanuel, somewhere singing begins. Listen. O oh, come, let us adore him. It's that time of the year. Christmas in a pandemic. What are you hoping for? What expectations do you have? Are you trusting in a vaccine? Listen to what Emmanuel says. This will take time, but make time. Make time to read your Bible and to notice how Jesus lived. Did you pick up the details that Christine mentioned earlier? Just tune in to what Jesus is saying as he speaks to people. Listen again for his words and notice his priorities. Worship at his feet. Worship? This Christmas, worship. Eugene Peterson says, Worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God. It doesn't satisfy our appetite, our hunger, but it whets our appetite. What a great idea. It doesn't satisfy our hunger, but it whets our appetite. As we worship, as we listen, as we feed on God in Christ, we, are, we know that this is what will satisfy. We become wanting more and more. The message of, of Emmanuel in our lives becomes metabolized, says uh, Peterson, into acts of love, cups of cold water, missions into all the world, healing and evangelism, the pursuit of justice in Jesus' name, hands raised in adoration of the Father and feet washed in the company of Jesus. God means to do something with you and me, and he means to do it in community. He wants us to be in on what he's doing, and we are in on it together. May God bless us this Christmas as we seek to draw near and to feed on him. He has come to us in Emmanuel. Let us be open to him. Let us hear his voice. Amen. Now we come to our time of prayer, and I've uh, drafted some things related to what I've been saying, and I hope and pray that as we bow before God now, he will hear and answer our prayers. Let us pray. Almighty God, it is a thing almost too wonderful for us to comprehend that you desire to be with us. In the person of Emmanuel, your beloved Son, you have overcome our sin and idolatry to bring us like prodigal children back into the loving embrace of your family. Our Father, as we move into the season when so many of our fellow Australians are focused on being with their family, we pray that as your children, we too will be welcoming and hospitable. We are conscious of those in need in our own community. We think of the homeless, the lonely, and all who struggle with health, especially mental health concerns, in the aftermath of long periods of lockdown. Lord Jesus, your earthly family were refugees, and you yourself had no home. We remember that in this damaged world, there are many seeking refuge from war, tyranny, injustice, and man's inhumanity to man. Forgive our complicity and make us gracious with our resources to reach out and support people in whatever way is within our power. As the number of COVID infections in Victoria has been zero for four weeks, we are grateful that restrictions have been eased still further and that state borders have been largely reopened. Please guide our political decision makers 
and medical advisors as we increase the return of citizens from overseas for family reunions. As COVID-19 continues to create grief in many places, we ask that wise decision-making will support and empower nurses and doctors so that they can offer the care which they are equipped to give without the diabolical responsibility of whom to turn away. Grant that soon the vaccines will become globally available. Give wisdom and goodwill to people with diplomatic responsibilities so that the affairs of the nations might be conducted with moral integrity and in peace. We think of the oppressive power of the Taliban and ask that the education of girls, especially in Afghanistan, where it is dreadfully threatened, will be preserved. Help all nations to manage their domestic affairs in such a way as to facilitate and promote work opportunities for their people. By your Holy Spirit, advance the ministry of the gospel to bring healing and support into the lives of every stressed family. We pray for children to escape screen captivity and enjoy healthy activities. Thank you for the safe return of Kylie Moore Gilbert from the detention in Iran. We remember Dr. Ken Elliott and Leah Sharibu, still detained by Islamist terrorists. Keep them safe and in your great mercy return them to their families. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. Amen.